Over the recent years, we've seen the rise of so many great cricketing sides, such as Afghanistan. And the Netherlands. Up in the air. Oh, this should be a run out. Don't end like this. They are going to end like this. England have been double Dutch. While this is all very inspiring, for these teams to rise up the rankings, someone has to fall. And few teams took a bigger fall than the mighty Chevrons. That's right, today we'll be looking at the downfall of Zimbabwe cricket. Formed in 1898 as the Rhodesia Cricket Team, they used to play in the South African domestic cricket tournament, the Curry Cup. The country of Zimbabwe did not exist yet, so successful players from this team would go on and play for the South African national team. Once they gained independence on April 18, 1980, Zimbabwe formed their own cricket team. And on July 21, 1981, they officially became an associate member of the ICC. That's where their journey truly started. Soon after its inception, the team was able to play in the 1983 World Cup. This was the first time they got to face off against quality opposition, and frankly, they weren't up to the mark. The team lost five out of six matches, but they did have a major positive note. They defeated the mighty Australia by 13 runs. The 1987 World Cup was an even more disappointing campaign for the Chevrons, as they lost all six group matches. This time was a game between Zimbabwe and New Zealand played at Hyderabad, the second closest match ever to be played in any World Cup. Zimbabwe won the toss and put New Zealand into bat. They did come very close to defeating New Zealand in a thrilling match where they lost by three runs, but history doesn't remember almost. And they stop and they go, and that, I'm afraid, is a rather sad end to a wonderful effort. The team did a better job at the 1992 World Cup. Well, sort of. This time, Zimbabwe only lost seven of the eight round robin stage matches. It may sound bad, but the win they had was simply legendary and remembered as one of the greatest upsets ever. Zimbabwe set a low target of 134. Zimbabwe finishing all out, 134 after 46 overs. Which, on any other day, England would easily chase, but Eddie Brandes had other plans. This legendary all-rounder took four wickets and helped stop the three Lions at 125, gaining his team a memorable nine-run win. When Jarvis had small court to seal the match, there seemed like 6,000 Zimbabweans had been at the game. With this win, Zimbabwe had announced themselves to the cricket world. In July of the same year, Zimbabwe cricket was about to change forever. The team became the ninth ever nation to gain test status and hence earned full membership of ICC. They had far from the perfect start though. In fact, they only managed to win one match in their first 30 matches against Pakistan in 1994-95. That one match was important, though, as it introduced the world to heavyweights Flower Brothers, Heath Streak, and, on his debut, Henry Olonga, the first black cricketer to ever play for his side. Right through his defense, so Henry Olonga has done it again. How did they introduce themselves, you ask? Well, Grant Flower scored a massive double century with 201 runs on the board and Andy Flower registered 156 runs on the board. Another notable mention is Guy Whittall, who scored 113 runs. Zimbabwe scored a whopping 544 runs, and Pakistan failed to reach that total, over two things in large part due to Streak, who took nine wickets. Little did the cricketing world know, those boys had a lot more in their lockers. And Heath Streak has struck once more, a prolific wicket-taker here. The Chevrons were about to enter their golden age with the aforementioned cricketers at the wheel. Prime among them was the legendary Andy Flower. Andy Flower was one of the great innovators. Who, who took Zimbabwe cricket to a different level. And it's one thing to say that Andy Flower uh, was the best batsman that Zimbabwe's ever had. Who is undeniably his country's greatest ever talent and one of the best wicketkeeper batsmen of all time. His brother, Grant, was a cracking batsman and they were joined in the batting lineup by Murray Goodwin and David Houghton. The bowling attack was also feared worldwide due to the inclusion of excellent spinners Paul Strang. That is close, and that's out. He looks surprised. And national hero Eddie Brandis. 
Well, that is a disaster for India. They also had a lightning quick pacer in Henry Olonga. Zimbabwe have won. And full marks to Henry Olonga there. The Zimbabweans delighted. In case the batsmen and bowlers failed to deliver, they even had world-class all-rounders in Heath Streak, Neil Johnson, Guy Whittall, and Andy Blignot. In 1998, the team took down both South Asian giants India and Pakistan in tests. They beat the men in green on Pakistani soil and took home a series. The India win was less impressive as it was played at home and a one-off test, but it was significant nonetheless. But what followed could only be described as a miracle by the fans. The 1999 World Cup rolled around and no one expected the African side to go far, but Captain Alistair Campbell had other plans. Campbell's men would shock everyone in the group stages, finishing third in Pool A and making it to the Super Sixes. They beat world-class sides India and South Africa through brilliant performances. He's bound to be, he's had a remarkable win by Zimbabwe. Their run in the Super Six was far less impressive, though, as they were dominated by Pakistan and Australia. It's gone for a oh, big hit. That's the biggest of the day. That's a ripper. And luckily drew against New Zealand due to rain. The team was not out of surprises yet, as they would impress again by reaching the quarters of the 2000 ICC Champions Trophy. Oh, that's a catch! That's out! Losing to eventual champions Chris Cairns' brilliant New Zealand. That's the end. Finishes with 4 for 45, the best bowling in the tournament. Zimbabwe all out for 201. Between 1997 and 2002, they beat every single Test nation, except Australia, and won a series against New Zealand both home and away in 2000 and 2001. This team was truly phenomenal. Issues started in 2001 when players began to complain about political interference. The funding decreased and a quota was placed to let in more black players. The problems hit their climax in 2003 when hosting the World Cup. Flower and Olonga wore black armbands to mourn the death of democracy. The campaign wasn't awful as they progressed to the Super Six through convincing victories against the Netherlands and Namibia. Their win against England made them progress. However, it was purely a result of England forfeiting due to safety concerns. They finished bottom of the group in the Super Six stage after some dismal performances. What's worse is that Olonga and Flower had to retire and flee the nation shortly after the tournament. In 2004, things went from bad to worse as captain and best player of the side, Streak, was sacked due to his involvement in rebellions. Fourteen players followed him out the door as a protest to the government's control over the board. The following year, 2005, the board made another controversial call by firing national team coach Phil Simmons in the middle of a series against New Zealand. Two thousand five was a dark year in the history of Zimbabwe as a whole. Under the leadership of Robert Mugabe, the government started Operation Murambatsvina. The Zanu PF government has embarked on what it calls a cleanup campaign, named Operation Murambatsvina. <laughs> Literally meaning, move the rubbish, a plan to clear the slums of the nation. The campaign displaced 700,000 people and caused shockwaves around the nation. Wherever there is evidence of small-scale business and trade, it is demolished and destroyed. Undoubtedly affecting the mental state of the cricketers and cricket itself in the country. In 2006, the Logan Cup, Zimbabwe's first class competition, was suspended. On the 18th of January 2006, Zimbabwe cricket announced that they were suspending the playing of Test cricket for the rest of the year. Would turn out that this hiatus would be much longer. Before the 2007 World Cup, to prevent another big protest, a few players were asked to sign contracts. According to many sources, these contracts were highly unethical. They were given an option between signing the contract or being left out of the squad and they needed to make the decision on the spot. This strategy may have worked in keeping players, but it did not help performances. Zimbabwe did really poorly in the 2007 Cricket World Cup. They even lost to non-test playing nation Ireland. Another man is gone. 
Well, the stumping, it's a tie. The 2007 T20 World Cup went much better though as they won their opening match against a legendary Australia side that had just won their third consecutive World Cup. Tossed up, full toss, that could go up. Leg side, down the leg side, he's going for four, it's four! Just look at these scenes, Zimbabwe are there. This was all thanks to a brilliant performance from Brendan Taylor. 50 on the board, a memorable 50. You'll see his name pop up a few times. He's perhaps the most important player for Zimbabwe in modern times. Shot. Oh, what a shot. What a way to bring up 100. They still exited in the group stages, but only on net run rate. 2011's World Cup did not bring them much joy. They started with 91 run thumping from Australia. Has done the trick. Australia have won this game, and they've won it by 91 runs. The next match may have gone well against a weak Canada side, but the one after that was another nightmare, as New Zealand crushed them with a 10-wicket victory. Well, Martin Guptill finishes it in style, much like he got things underway. The only other match they won was against another struggling side in Kenya. After six long years, the country finally returned to test cricket in 2011, and they came back in style, beating Bangladesh by 130 runs. They followed this feat by winning a five-match ODI series against the Tigers 3-2, Over the keeper, picking up their first series victory against a test side in five years. Lynn, it's in the air, there's a chance here, Bushy Sabanda's under it! He's got him! Zimbabwe's done it! Pushrik and Rahim just getting 100! They have won the series! They win by five runs! However, their fortunes did not change after these victories, as in the 2014 T20 World Cup, they were knocked out in the group stages by net run rate. The 2015 World Cup was not a very successful campaign either, as they only recorded one win against a new UAE side. However, their performance was actually not bad as they lost most of their matches on close margins. A special standout yet again was Brendan Taylor, who scored 433 runs in the tournament. Their 2016 T20 World Cup was much more upsetting for the fans as the team got knocked out in the first round against another new side in Afghanistan. Oh, straight up in the air, and has it gone all the way? They lost by a whopping 59 runs and were totally dominated throughout the match. Yeah, this time, excellent catch to finish off. After the tournament, the team started slipping down the rankings after various losses. They ranked so low that they had to play qualifiers for the 2019 World Cup, and tragically for the fans, for the first time in Zimbabwe's history, the team failed to qualify for the World Cup. The situation worsened for the fans as on July 19, 2019, ICC suspended Zimbabwe cricket because of government interference in their cricket board. As a result, the team could not play in the 2020 T20 World Cup. Even though the suspension was lifted in October of the same year, the team's poor performance did not stop. The team failed to qualify for the World Cup again in 2023. Despite having talented players such as all-rounders Sikandar Razak, batsman Hamilton Mazakadza, oh, goodness me, that's the biggest hit of the tournament, and obviously Brandon Taylor, the team earned little to no success in the modern era. At the core of Zimbabwe's issues lies one factor: money. Zimbabwe is a third-world country, and so financial aid is necessary for them to function properly. ICC has been rather supportive over the years, and even with that support, there have been numerous cases of player pay disputes. Due to the ban in 2019, funding from ICC was frozen and cricket in the country almost collapsed. Things got so bad that the board reduced salaries by 30% by early 2020, even though the ban was lifted long before that. The late payments were a major issue as recently as 2022. Zimbabwe cricket chief Tavangwa Makalani put it best when he said to the players, make sacrifices today and survive tomorrow. On top of the player wages, the country also fails to support grassroots cricket with a serious lack of club facilities and infrastructure. The domestic cricket system is not at the level that a world-class side needs it to be. The second issue is the corruption and mismanagement on the board. A rule of thumb is that politics and cricket don't mix, and so, Government interference is never a good idea. Zimbabwe ignored this rule and repeatedly got their government involved in cricketing matters. This led to the collapse that we're witnessing today. Furthermore, players even complained about a lack of communication from the board. 
Without communication, a board simply cannot run efficiently. These two problems have caused many players to switch nationality and play for other countries. Two notable cases are England star all-rounders Sam Curran and New Zealand's World Test Championship winner Colin de Grandom. It certainly isn't over for Zimbabwe cricket, as they recently made it all the way to the Super 12 in the 2022 T20 World Cup. What's more, they qualified for the 2027 ODI World Cup as well. The future is bright for the Chevrons, as long as they keep politics and sports separate.